Thank you, everyone. We'll now reconvene the ACIP meeting. Um, at the start of this meeting, I am looking at Dr. Romero uh, to uh, give him an opportunity to make a brief statement before we move on to the next set of conversations. Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So um, before the committee begins uh, the next series of uh, presentations, I want to make uh, I want to take a moment to reinforce the importance of the Advisory Committee on Immunizations Practices input as we plan for the future use of COVID vaccines and potential updates to the nation's COVID-19 vaccination efforts. These initial discussions by you, the ACIP voting members, and its liaisons are happening at a time when there is still limited data and several unanswered questions. However, it's essential that your discussions not be paralyzed by these uncertainties and limitations. The information previously and to be presented to you will allow you to assess what is now several years of viral and vaccine data. Nevertheless, it is important that we acknowledge the multiple uncertainties and unknowns that exist. Hopefully, the information presented will begin to help you plan for the best path forward when it comes to the use of our available COVID-19 vaccines. CDC is encouraged to hear of your support for tentative plans to harmonize COVID-19 vaccine efforts and shift from the original monovalent primary vaccine formulation to a formulation used for updated bivalent boosters. While this would not happen until the appropriate FDA authorizations, it's clear that concurrence on a single vaccine composi composition for primary and booster doses would help streamline and simplify CDC's recommendations, reduce complexity, and allow for clearer communication and guidance to healthcare providers and to the public. CDC recognizes that the previous three years have been very difficult for the ACIP as they have cracked, crafted their recommendations. I know this firsthand having occupied a seat at the inner table uh, during the initial 18 months of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, SARS uh, pandemic. You uh, have often been asked to make difficult decisions without all the information that you would have desired in order to quickly respond to this evolving and unprecedented global pandemic uh, and public health emergency. This has led to the crafting of incremental vaccine policies that have at times added complexity to our COVID-19 vaccinations and schedules. Despite the previously mentioned challenges, you have helped shape vaccine policies that have ultimately helped protect millions of people across the United States and save millions of lives. CDC and the American public are grateful for your contributions and your leadership. CDC remains committed to the efforts to ensure optimal vaccine recommendations as we move forward. CDC will continue to monitor the SARS-CoV-2 evolution, COVID-19 disease levels, and vaccine safety and effectiveness in the months ahead. I and the CDC look forward to hearing your thoughts and insights this afternoon as you discuss the future direction of COVID-19 vaccines, COVID-19 vaccine program, and potential updated recommendations for this fall. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for those comments, Dr. Romero. We will now uh, move on to Dr. Megan Wallace, who will be speaking about the benefit and risk assessment for COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. Wallace. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon. Next slide, please. In this presentation, I will first show the benefits of COVID-19 vaccine by age for the primary series. Then I will present the incremental benefits of COVID-19 vaccine by age and time since last dose for a bivalent booster dose, with sensitivity analyses modeling high and low points in the pandemic. And finally, I will present the benefit risk assessment for the bivalent booster dose, focused on ages 12 to 17 years and 18 to 49 years. Next. I wanna begin by reviewing the methods we used. We performed the assessment for both primary series and bivalent booster with the results presented per million primary series or per million bivalent booster doses. 
We use the COVID net COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates from December, which were the most recently available rates by vaccination status. But we also use sensitivity analyses to model high and low points in the pandemic. Our time horizon, or the period over which we allow benefits of vaccination to accrue, was six months. We use the vaccine effectiveness estimates from Vision with the assumption of waning by 10% each month starting after month two. VE for the primary series assessment was based on the absolute VE for a bivalent dose, and the VE for the bivalent booster assessment was based on the relative VE by interval from last monovalent dose to bivalent dose. Next. On this slide, we are looking at the monthly rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalization by vaccination status from COVID-Net, which is the main driver of these assessments. The green line is the rate among the unvaccinated, which is the basis of our primary series assessment. The blue line is the rate among the vaccinated, which is the basis of our bivalent booster assessment. As I mentioned on the previous slide, both assessments use the December rates, which are the rates shown on the far right of the figure. We showed the overall age-adjusted rates here for simplicity, but if you look in the table on the right side of the slide, as we all know, there are considerable differences in the hospitalization rates by age group. Next slide, please. This slide shows the estimated COVID-19 associated hospitalizations prevented for every million mRNA COVID-19 primary series. The bars show the number of hospitalizations prevented over a six-month period, with the rows representing different age groups. As you can see, there are still significant benefits to primary series vaccination. The benefits are the most striking in the older adults with nearly 16,000 hospitalizations prevented per million doses given. But even for children, we see nearly 250 hospitalizations prevented per million doses given. Next. Now on this slide, for those age groups for which there were sufficient data, We've added the benefits of the bivalent booster, represented by the blue bars, which are again the estimated hospitalizations prevented per million doses over six months. These are the additional benefits one would expect from a bivalent booster beyond the benefits they are already receiving from any previous monovalent doses. Not surprisingly, the expected benefits are smaller for the bivalent booster than the primary series but they are still substantial in the older adults with nearly 2,500 hospitalizations prevented per million doses. However, for the adolescents, these numbers are smaller than what we've seen in the past, with an estimated 53 hospitalizations prevented in 12 to 17 year olds per million doses over six months. Next. Dosing interval refers to the time between the most recent monovalent dose and a bivalent dose. This figure focuses only on the benefits of the bivalent booster doses, showing them by both age group and dose interval. The rows are still age groups, and the blue shading of the bars indicates the dosing interval, with darker, darker shades representing longer intervals. We can see that dosing interval has a noticeable impact on the benefits, with longer intervals showing greater benefit. Next. Because benefits of a bivalent booster dose were smallest in the 12 to 17 year old age group, and because the benefit assessment is so strongly impacted by hospitalization rates, we use sensitivity analyses to explore what our benefits would look like in this age group under different epidemiologic scenarios, focusing on the time since the Omicron surge. This figure shows the hospitalization rates in 12 to 17 year olds by vaccination status. As we discussed before, the far right data point labeled as recent is what we used as our base case. We also calculated benefits from a low hospitalization rate scenario, which came from March 2022, and a high hospitalization rate scenario, which came from July 2022. For both the low and high scenario, we held the rate steady for the six month time horizon. Next. This slide shows the results of those sensitivity analyses, again, focusing only on 12 to 17 year olds. The rows are now the dosing intervals, and the shading indicates the incidence, with the lighter shade representing our low incidence scenario, and the darker shade representing our high incidence scenario. As we can see, the benefits are driven strongly by hospitalization rates, but in what we are considering our high incidence setting, we would prevent around 120 hospitalizations per million doses over six months, depending on the dosing interval. Next. 
The dosing intervals have been different for monovalent and bivalent booster doses. Among adolescents who received a monovalent booster, nearly half received the monovalent booster at an interval less than eight months after their primary series. Among those adolescents that received a bivalent booster dose, over 90% received it eight months or more after their most recent monovalent dose. Next slide, please. We also want to consider the potential myocarditis risk following the bivalent booster dose in this age group. Right now, there are limited data to inform the myocarditis risk following a bivalent booster dose. Preliminary data from VSD have myocarditis rates following bivalent booster dose in adolescent males being lower than what was seen for the first booster dose, but this is limited by small numbers of doses administered. Myocarditis risk is lower with longer time between doses. We saw that rates of myocarditis were lower with an extended interval between dose one and dose two for the primary series. A longer interval between doses for bivalent boosters compared to monovalent boosters may also impact myocarditis rates. Most individuals with myocarditis or pericarditis have fully recovered at follow-up. And in previously published analyses, the risk of adverse cardiac outcomes were 1.8 to 5.6 times higher after SARS-CoV-2 infection than after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination among males ages 12 to 17 years. Next. This slide shows the myocarditis rates from VSD shown in Dr. Sumabakuro's presentation earlier by age and sex for dose two of the primary series, the monovalent booster dose, and the preliminary data for the bivalent booster dose. As you can see in the set of columns on the right, there have been few bivalent doses captured in VSD, but there has only been one myocarditis case reported in any of these age groups. And if you look at the incidence rates by dose, we see that the risk might be trending downward with bivalent boosters having the lowest risk. But again, these are small numbers and wide confidence intervals. Next. This slide shows the Moderna myocarditis rates from VSD. Again, looking at the far right columns, there have been no myocarditis cases reported, but there have been few bivalent booster doses captured. Next. When we look at both the potential benefits and harms for adolescents together, using the hospitalization ranges from the sensitivity analyses, we see that per million doses we would expect to prevent between 31 and 136 hospitalizations, nine to 40 ICU admissions, and one death. Based on the preliminary data on myocarditis following bivalent booster and VSD, we have seen zero myocarditis cases in nearly 50,000 males that have received a bivalent booster dose and no cases in females with a similar number of doses. I want to again stress that these are small numbers of doses, and though they correspond to a point estimate of zero myocarditis cases per million doses, you can see in the footnote that the upper range of the 95% confidence interval runs from zero to 62 cases per million doses. Next. On this slide, we have taken the results from the previous slide and applied a correction to account for the potential incidental SARS-CoV-2 infections among hospitalized patients that Dr. Taylor discussed in the COVID-NET presentation. After applying this correction, we estimate that per million doses over six months, we would expect to prevent between 17 and 75 hospitalizations, five to 22 ICU admissions, and potentially a death. Next. If we look at the benefit risk assessment for 18 to 49 year olds per million doses over six months, we expect to prevent between 117 and 376 hospitalizations, 21 to 69 ICU admissions, and between four and 11 deaths. Among 18 to 39 year olds in VSD, we have seen one myocarditis case in a male with over 180,000 bivalent booster doses given. No cases have been reported in females who have had even more doses recorded. And I know that 18 to 49 is a fairly wide age group for benefits, and unfortunately we aren't able to stratify it further for rates by vaccine status. But if we look at hospitalization rates overall, we see that 18 to 29 year olds have lower rates than 30 to 49 year olds, but higher rates than the adolescents. So the 18 to 29 year old benefit risk would likely have lower numbers for benefits than what we see here, but probably still a bit higher than what we saw for adolescents. Next slide, please. And if we apply the correction for potential incidental SARS-CoV-2 infections among hospitalized patients, we estimate that between 81 and 259 hospitalizations, 
15 to 48 ICU admissions, and between three and eight deaths would be prevented. Next. There are several important limitations to the benefit risk assessment that should be noted. First, the benefits of vaccination may continue to accrue beyond the time horizon used. Stable hospitalization rates were assumed for the duration of the time horizon, which we know may not represent what will happen in the future. The underlying complexity of vaccine histories and previous infections could not be accounted for. COVID-net hospitalization rates included hospitalizations for which COVID-19 was not a primary reason for admission. The extent to which COVID-19 hospitalization rates include incidental findings is the extent to which benefits may be overestimated. Current COVID-19 epidemiology reflects the impact of both prior vaccination and prior infection. We cannot account for possible future increases in COVID-19 hospitalization rates or a new variant. Myocarditis rates following bivalent booster dose are uncertain. Studies are underway to assess the long-term impact of vaccine-associated myocarditis. Next slide. In summary, significant benefit is still seen for primary series vaccination in all age groups. The benefits of a bivalent booster dose vary by age, time since last dose, and COVID-19 incidence. The risk of myocarditis after COVID-19 vaccines is likely reduced by a longer interval since last dose. Additional data can better define risk after bivalent vaccines, but current data are encouraging. Changes in COVID-19 hospitalization rates would impact the benefit assessment. There are additional benefits of COVID-19 vaccines unable to be quantified in the benefit risk assessment, including likely prevention of post-COVID conditions, possible reduction in transmission, and increased confidence in social interaction. The benefit risk assessment will continue to be monitored as new data are available. Receipt of primary series continues to be important in all ages and boosters remain an important option to improve protection against severe COVID-19, especially for higher risk populations. Next. In closing, I want to thank all of those that made important contributions to this work, and in particular, Danny Mulia, who is integral. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wallace. Excellent presentation. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. Thank you, Dr. Wallace, for a great presentation and your team for pulling all this information together. It's very important and very clearly stating um, what the risks and benefits are. One of the questions I'd like to um, get clarification is um, for the COVID net and COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, does that include the multi-inflammatory syndrome of childhood? Would that be captured? Yes, I believe MISC is captured in those rates. Although Dr. Taylor, if you're still on the line and would like to add anything. I, I am Megan. Um, so we, we can capture them, but um, the data that is um, the data that are collected are collected at time of hospitalization. Um, so we would only we would only capture MISC if it was um, listed as an underlying medical condition, um, and not we would not be able to capture MISC in COVID net that was diagnosed after um, the hospitalization that is included in the COVID net. Okay, so that thank you for that clarification. So um, you are definitely capturing a fair number of cases of MISC, and but it may be an underestimate, if anything, um, is my interpretation. Um, I love this information. We know that MISC is fair, um, peaks in the younger children, so I do hope at some time we'll be able to see five to eleven. The other thing that you talked about was. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is, what, how much do I decrease my risk of MISC if I'm vaccinated? And I hope eventually we'll be able to answer that question, and same with long COVID for both children and adults. Thank you. Uh, this is Chris Taylor again. I just wanted to add, I, I, I don't want to provide the impression that we, that we capture a significant number. Um, I don't have the the numbers of cases that we have captured, um, but I, I I just want to be clear that I, I'm 
I'm not sure that I'm able to clap to to classify that as a significant um, number as it's an underlying medical condition present at the time of hospitalization. Okay, so then it could be a significant underestimate. Thank you. Potentially. And then I think we may, our, our uh, VE experts may be able to, to provide, there is some information on per VE against MISC. Um, Yes, there was actually an MMWR published um, about a year ago that looked at vac um, vaccine effectiveness of the primary series in children and adolescents against MISC, which did show high protective effect um, of primary series vaccination. Again, that was monovalent vaccination against MISC. And an article in August in Clinical Infectious Diseases, we'd be happy to share, um, looking again at um, reduced likelihood of MISC in children ages 5 to 18 years of age. Um, that primary series vaccination was associated with reduced likelihood of MISC in children 5 to 18 years of age. As well. Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that presentation, Dr. Wallace. Um, <clears throat> just a, a, a piece of context would be helpful for me, which is that I noticed you didn't provide updated risk benefit for folks over the age of 50 or 65, and is that because we don't think there's vaccine-associated myocarditis in that age group? Because I think the, the, the benefits are still worth sort of um, reiterating um, in, this, in this setting. Thank you. Certainly, and, and you're right. We didn't focus on them for the benefit-risk comparison because, you know, the, the risk is primarily in those younger age groups, and that's also the age group where the benefits are the smallest. But if we go to... Slide seven. We can see in the older age groups, you know, 50 to 64, 65 plus, you know, even depending on dosing interval, there's still pretty substantial benefits, but particularly in that 65 plus age group, I mean, they're, they're pretty remarkable, you know, for even for the bivalent booster, just the incremental benefit. We see, you know, 2,500 hospitalizations prevented, which is pretty substantial. Dr. Duchin. Thank you, Jeff Duchin, Infectious Disease Society of America. Uh, this is a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I, I just want to hit on um, one point, which I think is really important, and that is the um, priority that we should be giving to better understanding uh, the spectrum and burden of post-COVID conditions in general and incorporating them into um, uh, information on the benefits and risks of um, COVID-19 vaccination. I think, we, you know, right now we know that there are um, diseases such as myocardial infarction, and we talked about stroke uh, this morning, um, diabetes, neurological disease, other metabolic disease, long COVID, and so on, that we're not really measuring and capturing well and incorporating into our decision-making around a whole spectrum of uh, COVID-19 prevention. So I just wanted to highlight the need for better data and hopefully once that's available, we can use that to better understand the benefits of these vaccinations. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that comment. And as it's, certainly we reassess this pretty frequently and as soon as data are available, we're always looking for ways to, to incorporate more things into the benefit risk. So I appreciate that and, 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 and agree. Thank you. I'm actually just going to second that. I do think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on um, PASC or long COVID, especially in children. Um, but there are multiple uh, federal efforts in this space. And so we appreciate, again, the uh, continued collaboration across federal agencies to do this information sharing so that we can ensure that we are optimizing the benefit risk balance. Um, the only less, you know, so I really appreciate the overall um, summary and the um, uh, the summative statement that you know benefits continue to outweigh the risks for primary series in all age groups, I think, is a really important one to emphasize, um, and to also uh, uh, continue to ask our committee to think through what else can we do to mitigate risk uh, via the schedule. It's it's a comp it's still a complex schedule, but as things start to simplify over time, it'll be helpful for us to think about those longer intervals, for example, as an important in um, intervention that we are able to implement. Uh, when uh, either the context or uh, the individual risk, i.e. immunocompromise, uh, doesn't otherwise indicate a shorter interval. 
um, with that, I think we will move on. Is this truly the last session of the day? <laughs> Dr. Oliver, okay, I can't believe it. All right, um, Dr. Sarah Oliver will be presenting on COVID-19 considerations for future planning, um, after which we anticipate a robust discussion. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. I was gonna say, that's it. I just, I'll present some slides and then you guys discuss the whole future. <laughs> just, just that. Um, Great, thank you so much. So for this presentation, we'll think through considerations for future planning for COVID vaccines. Next slide. So for planning purposes, we need to be aware and evaluate where we are now, and then identify and discuss where we're going. Next slide. And then obviously how we get there. Next slide. So as we flesh that out, we're gonna review where we are now, including current recommendation, vaccination rates, and hospitalization rates for the program at large. Then as we think through where we're going, I think we've continued to say this today, but the goal is clear, simple recommendations. So as we think through how we get there, we have two questions we're gonna focus on today. How frequently should people get a COVID vaccine? And are there groups or population who should potentially have more frequent COVID vaccines, such as more than one vaccine a year? We'll start first by reviewing where we are now. Next slide. These are our current recommendations for COVID vaccines. The point of this is not to review each individual recommendation, but that clearly the recommendations we have right now are complex. Next slide. Then we've showed this slide previously, but now I'm highlighting the uptake among the booster doses. Uptake is higher with older ages, but as you look, even uptake for the bivalent booster is only around 40% for those who are 65 and over. Next slide. Then this slide shows COVID vaccine um, uh, delivery and uptake by age group. You can see that in general, uptake has declined as the number of doses recommended have progressed. But you can also see that people tend to get vaccinated in waves shortly after the recommendations. Next slide. So why is vaccine coverage lower than we may want? First, recent studies reflect profound COVID-19 vaccine message fatigue, COVID vaccine, um, COVID message fatigue uh, for COVID mitigation measures, COVID vaccines, all of it. Um, they reflect a desire to end the use of mitigation measures and a common perception that immunity is sufficient without future vaccine doses. We know there are other reasons as well. Barriers to vaccine access do still persist for some populations as well, including but uh, certainly not limited to people who live in rural areas, people experiencing homelessness, and people with disabilities. We also know that despite improvements in vaccine equity after primary series vaccination that we saw with the incredible efforts in 2021 to get people vaccinated with the primary series, we've seen disparities in booster coverage that have emerged. Next slide. Then we also know that the uh, virus continues to evolve. This slide shows recent uh, variant proportions over time with the recent surveillance estimating that nearly three quarters of isolates may be projected to be XBB.1.5, which is in the darker purple here recently. Next slide. However, I think this curve is important as well. This is the estimated number of reported COVID cases um, by variant. So essentially combining the epi curves and the variant proportions. So you can see even with newer variants we've seen, we're not seeing the massive increases in cases like we did in the winter of 2021, 2022. Next slide. Then we're also in a period where most adults have had SARS-CoV-2 infection, vaccine, or both. The two bars on the far left show overall seroprevalence among adults from a study among US uh, blood donors. And only 6% at the top have had neither infection nor vaccine in these Q2 estimates of 2022. Next slide. Then this slide shows the overall hospitalization rates by age. We know the highest hospitalization rates continue to be among older adults. However, hospitalization rates among those less than 65 years have not mirrored the similar increases recently as they did earlier in the pandemic. Next slide. And then you've seen this slide previously, but we know that hospitalization rates are the lowest among those who've received a bivalent vaccine. 
Um, again, hospitalization rates were 16 times higher among unvaccinated compared to those who'd had a bivalent booster dose. Next slide. So just a summary of where we are now. Our current COVID vaccine recommendations are complex. An uptake of the current bivalent vaccines is low. The SARS-CoV-2 virus continues to evolve, but recent virus evolution has not led to large population level surges in cases or hospitalizations. Most adults have prior infection, prior vaccination, or both. And hospitalization rates are highest in older adults, but remain low among people who've received a bivalent booster. Next slide. So now in thinking through how we get there, first we'll address question one, how frequently should people get a COVID vaccine? Next slide. COVID cases are shown on the left figure and COVID hospitalizations are shown on the right. While our ability to capture COVID cases has changed over time with increasing utilization of the home antigen test, we continue to be able to closely monitor COVID hospitalizations. Then the winter months for the last three years are highlighted in the yellow boxes. We've seen increases in cases and hospitalizations um, either during the winter months due to development of a new immune escape variant, or unfortunately, as we saw during the BA1 winter surge, when we have both. However, if you notice, this most recent winter did not have the increases seen for either of the previous two winters. Next slide. Then this figure shows VE against hospitalizations um, for the first part of uh, 2022. The estimates have been shown to ACIP and are published previously, so the point of this is not the exact estimate. These aren't um, uh, brand new. These are for the monovalent vaccines. But it's to point um, trends over time and with number of doses. So the green dot is two-dose VE. The blue dots are three doses, and the black dots are estimates with four doses, again, all monovalent. With the monovalent COVID vaccines, we note that we've seen declines in VE over time since last dose. This is likely impacted by both time since vaccination and continued virus evolution. We do know that additional vaccine doses restored protection lost over time. While it's too soon to know the impact of waning in virus evolution on the VE of the bivalent vaccines over time, we're continuing to closely monitor and we'll bring any updates we have to ACIP. Next slide. So then this is VE against, uh, with the bivalent vaccines. This is against hospitalization. Again, looking at how VE varies by time since last dose. We know that this impacts uh, the additional protection. The relative VE of bivalent boosters, again, as we've highlighted, meaning the additional benefits of the bivalent booster are higher the longer it's been since your prior monovalent dose. And as we discussed earlier today, safety is also likely improved with a longer time between doses since the myocarditis risk appears lower with that longer interval. Next slide. So winter months and immune escape variants have impacted COVID epidemiology. However, this past winter did not see quite the same level of increases in cases or hospitalizations as previous winters. Time since last vaccine dose may both increase the incremental benefit of a COVID vaccine and decrease the risk of myocarditis. However, we do have to balance that with the fact that vaccine protection likely does decline over time. A plan for a fall booster dose this year could provide added protection at a time when many would be around one year from their last dose. And future epidemiology and SARS-CoV-2 virus evolution could help determine the need for continued annual boosters. Next slide. So now moving to, a pop to populations who may need more than one dose a year. First, are there populations who still need a primary series in the future? While most adults have completed a primary series, most children six months through four years of age remain unvaccinated as shown in the table here. For most older children, adults, adolescents and adults, future doses will be an additional boost after prior infection, prior vaccination or both. In addition, young children will continue to age into the vaccine recommendation at six months and could be SARS-CoV-2 naive. 
So because of this, there is likely some population of young children that still need a prime and a boost model to optimize immunity. Next slide. These data are from the excellent University of Iowa colleagues who've been able to conduct rapid surveys around intent. We know that while vaccination remain, uh, rates remain low in these youngest age group, there are still parents with intent to vaccinate their young child. For parents with an un or under vaccinated child six to 23 months and two to four years, for both 38% uh, said that they had an intent to get their child vaccinated in the next month or so. We also know that doctors' offices and clinics continue to be the most trusted place for parents to have their child receive a COVID vaccine. So thinking through optimal strategies for primary series vaccination in this young pediatric population continues to be important. Next slide. This slide is again from the COVID net presentation earlier, but we've highlighted here only children six months through four years of age to compare six months through two and two to four years of age. And you can see that pediatric hospitalization rates are higher among the six months to less than two years of age. Next slide. Then this slide shows pediatric seroprevalence, looking at infection-induced immunity on the left, and then combined infection plus vaccination-induced immunity on the right. We know that the youngest children, those six through 11 months, have the lowest both infection and combined immunity, and it increases with age of the child. Next slide. So as we think through a population that may still need a primary series, children uh, less than two years have higher COVID hospitalization rates than older children. Children less than four years are less likely to have both prior infection and prior vaccination. We also know that children have frequent visits to healthcare providers. The AAP's recommended schedule for young children is on the right, and you can see that prior to three years of age, children are recommended to go to the pediatrician at least every six months, if not more, when they're younger. So the work group discussed continued primary series recommendation for young children, both ages six months through two years and six months through four years were discussed without a clear consensus from the work group for either age cutoff. Without a clear cutoff from the data, the work group thought feasibility could also be considered as we think through this. Next slide. So the next population to talk about is older adults. This slide breaks out hospitalization rates in the adult population into a little more detail, and you can see that the highest hospitalization rates are among those 75 years of age and over, followed by those 65 to 74. Next slide. Um, and then when we focus on COVID-associated hospitalization rates by vaccination status, you see similar patterns to what we've seen before. This is specifically looking at those 65 years and over, and again, hospitalization rates are the highest among unvaccinated, while rates among those who've received a bivalent booster continue to be low. Next slide. We know that immunity and vaccine response can be different in older adults. This is a slide from Dr. Britton's presentation earlier. While this is VE against symptomatic disease and not hospitalization, you can see that the patterns of vaccine effectiveness, including waning, may be different in older adults. However, waning for bivalent VE against hospitalization, including older adults, isn't yet known, but again, we're continuing to monitor. Next slide. So in summary for this population, older adults have higher rates of hospitalization than younger adults, but the rates of vaccination among older adults who've re already received their bivalent booster remain low. The work group emphasized the importance of older adults being up to date on current recommendations, including receiving a bivalent booster. The work group discussed more frequent COVID-19 vaccine doses for older adults, and at this time felt that the data were insufficient to determine a conclusion. The data weren't conclusive to yet identify a need for frequent vaccines, and there was concern that it may not be feasible to implement a vaccine program in all adults 65 and over twice a year. However, there was much discussion that these recommendations can be updated based on closely monitoring data in older adults, including hospitalization rates of older adults who've received a bivalent booster, bivalent VE and patterns of waning in older adults, as well as SARS-CoV-2 virus evolution and the possibility of future immune escape variants. Next slide. 
Then the final group to discuss, should people with immunocompromising conditions be recommended for more frequent vaccines? Numerous studies have demonstrated that mRNA COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness among immunocompromised persons is lower than that of immunocompetent persons, including within the period of Omicron. This has been demonstrated across a range of immunocompromising conditions, but is particularly notable for organ or stem cell transplant recipients. Then we also know we've previously had recommendations for different numbers of vaccine doses for these individuals. Prior to the bivalent booster dose, we allowed for up to five monovalent doses of COVID vaccine in this population. Vaccine effectiveness studies are not yet sufficiently powered to evaluate the effectiveness of a bivalent booster among persons with immunocompromise. Next slide. However, if we look at what we do know from monovalent vaccines, this figures from a published paper, and I know that there's a lot of data points here, but the point is really to compare the VE among persons with an immunocompromising condition, which is in the red box, to people without immunocompromising conditions, which are the um, VE estimates above. And you can see that VE among immunocompromised persons is lower than that of immunocompetent persons at comparable time points after dose two and dose three. And we also know that VE wanes in both immunocompetent and immunocompromised people. Next slide. So in summary for this population, immunocompromised adults can have a less robust immune response to COVID vaccines. And while not necessarily the scope of ACIP for now, it's important to note that there's not currently any authorized prophylactic monoclonal antibody products for these populations at higher risk of COVID-19. The work group discussed more frequent COVID-19 vaccine doses for people with immunocompromising conditions, and again at this time felt that the data were insufficient to determine a conclusion for recommendations, for definitive recommendations moving forward. However, the work group acknowledged that this population in particular may continue to be more vulnerable to severe COVID and likely needs flexibility with future COVID-19 vaccine recommendations. Next slide. So again, revisiting where we would like to go to the goal of simple recommendations. Next slide. COVID-19 vaccines continue to be the most effective tool we have to prevent serious illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID. The goal of the COVID-19 vaccine program continues to be prevention of severe disease, but we do know that prevention of post-COVID condition, increased confidence in social interactions, and even a temporary protection against symptomatic disease can be important as well. And as we've discussed throughout today, the benefits of an additional COVID-19 vaccine booster doses vary by age, by time since last dose, and by COVID incidence. We know that a simple, simplified annual recommendation could help reduce vaccine and message fatigue. And a COVID vaccine framework that is similar to a well-understood influenza vaccine framework could be easy for COVID vaccine providers to implement and for the public to understand. Next slide. So for the overall work group thoughts on considerations for future planning, simple recommendations are easier to communicate, which also may improve uptake. The work group was very supportive of simplified recommendations and planning for future of COVID vaccines, which could also include additional updates to COVID vaccines in the future, as was discussed at the recent VRPAC meeting. However, uncertainties remain for the ideal timing in populations for future booster doses, especially if new immune escape variants develop. The work group was supportive of a fall or annual COVID vaccine program, at least for this year, with the flexibility to adjust adjust based on new data, especially for populations at higher risk. The work group will continue to review data to inform future deliberations, vaccine effectiveness of bivalent vaccines over time, safety data of the bivalent vaccines, um, especially monitoring myocarditis rates as there are more doses administered, cost effectiveness analyses, COVID-19 epi, including hospitalization rates among the vaccinated and boosted people, SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance and virus evolution, and data from vaccine manufacturers as they continue to study these vaccines as well. Next slide. So again, acknowledging and thanking uh, the um, team that helps pull all of this together. Next slide. So again, as we turn to the discussion, I wanna emphasize that discussions for the um, future COVID vaccine recommendations are pre-decisional and are intended to inform planning and additional analyses. 
There's again, no vote today, but it just will be helpful to hear ACIP thoughts as we plan for the future and continue to monitor the evolving situation. So we've, we have three kind of specific questions that we would love to get thoughts from ACIP on. What does ACIP think about children who may still need a primary series? Um, and then in particular, what age groups might that be best focused on? What does ACIP think about future recommendations for older adults? And what does ACIP think about future recommendations for people with immunocompromising conditions? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Oliver, that was excellent. I was trying, and thank you for putting up the questions at the end. I was trying to remember them all as you were speaking, so <laughs> I appreciate you putting it together. Um, this presentation is open for questions. Dr. Lair. I'm, could you please clarify what you mean by think about children who may still need a primary series? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Well, so I guess the, the work group agreed with the concept that, you know, there is a population that's going to continue to age in. Uh, there is likely to be an immune naive um, population that needs kind of still a prime boost. Um, what the work group, um, it didn't feel like the data was completely clear and would love to get ACIP's thoughts on, is is there a specific age group? So would we say um, for kids who've never had a COVID vaccine before, who are six months through two years of age, they need a primary series and after that, um, they could get, you know, an annual um, booster dose, similar to flu. Like, there is a population for flu, if you've not had a flu shot before, where you get two vaccines in your first series because you need the prime boost. So it's specifically saying, is there a population that we would really want to say, if you've not had a COVID vaccine before, you need a primary series, and what population that would be? So six months to two or six months to four. Oh. But wouldn't that be true for an 11-year-old or a 23-year-old who hasn't had a primary series who wants one? Well, I mean, good question, and I think we can continue to discuss that. I think based on some of the seroprevalence rates, um, that has been a discussion that if we, if we think it is likely that um, people, you know, uh, children and adolescents have probably, based on the seroprevalence data, have likely been exposed. Um, that uh, would we still recommend a, you know, a multi-dose primary series um, in those populations in the future if we think, um, but happy to hear your thoughts on this. I think this is, this is what, we've been, what we've been trying to, um, to discuss. Dr. Daly, I don't know if you might be able to say that slightly better than I did. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, th I think, <clears throat> I don't know that I can say it better, but I can say it different. Um, no, just that, um, Part of a conversation about who needs an annual booster is, is, is what to do about people who never received the primary series and where, and where they fit in. And I think under this paradigm, which is not decided on, which we're here to discuss today, and problematically, we don't have a ton of data for, I think the idea is that... Uh, 18 year old who's never gotten the primary series but has been infected and then gets a single dose in the fall probably has decent protection. We don't know that as established fact, but I think that's an assumption underlying this that an 18 year old might just get a single dose and you and, and the recommendation would not be get two doses and then get an annual, book, annual dose. Um, so in other words, we're at a pivot point and for those young adults who've never been vaccinated, probably they would just get a single annual dose and be considered up to date, quote unquote. Did that, did I get that right, Dr. Oliver? Yes. Okay. Dr. S I don't know who raised their hand first. Yeah. Dr. Sanchez. <laughs> no, thank you, um, Dr. Oliver. It seems to me that um, with respect to the question here, I think if, um, and that data should be available, that if, I don't care what age, even if the young child who's already had a documented um, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, likely doesn't need a primary series. And I, I think that that, I, I think that data should be available and can be looked at. Um, so, and I know that makes it a little bit more complicated rather than just say every child less than five should get a primary series. But I think if you've had a documented infection, you probably would just need a booster. Um, 
Now, the other things, um, I also have a question. You don't mention pregnancy, pregnant women. And would you recommend, I think that's another um, population that needs to be looked at. Should every pregnant woman receive a COVID booster during each pregnancy to prevent, to prevent um, not only infection in her, but also in the infant less than six months of age? So I think that that also should be brought to the work group and with the discussion. Um, in terms of the timing, mean, I just cannot imagine um, ha getting a COVID booster or a, a more than once a year. I, I mean, if you want to simplify the, this scheme, I just cannot imagine that it can be even more frequent, even among the immunocompromised those after they've had their primary series. But I will leave it to um, to Dr. Cotton if she's on the call because uh, I don't. That's her territory. <laughs> um, and then um, we haven't heard anything about Novavax and what is the scheme of things with Novavax in all of this. Um, so there's a lot of questions there. But <laughs> um. So first of all, thank you for your thoughts. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I will say, uh, we have heard from some of our implementation-minded colleagues that having vaccine recommendations that differ based on prior SARS-CoV-2 testing would be would potentially be difficult to implement. I'm happy to hear from additional, um, you know, if we think that that has changed, um, but I know that that has been, um, you know, a continued discussion as, as we've discussed this on the work group. Then I specifically wanted to say something about um, uh, your, your comment with um, pregnant individuals. Um, I didn't include that here because that's, we've not, fundamentally had. This is more um, consistent with where we've kind of been with recommendations in the past. That would fundamentally be a little bit different. But I will say that that is um, one of the kind of top priorities for what we have for additional analyses to go uh, moving forward is to really do a deeper dive. I think we're getting emerging data on that and really look forward to um, kind of outlining all the available data we have to answer that question and to bring it to ACIP. So I think it it wasn't included here because it's, it's, I think, um, we need a, a separate deeper dive on the data, but, but that is um, up on the docket for uh, things for us to tackle next. I, you know, I see we had, do have colleagues from ACOG and ACNM on. It would be, if you, if you are interested in, um, you know, providing any comment uh, of, you know, where the organizations stand today, that would be really helpful. Um, this um, is Rhoda Sperling from ACOG. Um, I think it's, you know, the last comments were actually music to my ears that, 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 that a deeper dive is coming with information about pregnancy, because I think that that needs, is an important question about vaccination during pregnancy and what considerations are, are given. Thank you. And Ms. Hayes? Yes, Carol Hayes with the American College of Nurse Midwives. I think I have some concerns and I I would love to hear anybody else's um, understanding of this, but when we look at the bivalent va vaccine and its ability to um, maintain a robust immune response, um, I'm thinking back to pertussis and whooping cough, and you know, it, it was a vaccine that waned so quickly. We had to make that recommendation that every pregnant woman in every pregnancy get vaccinated, and we had a really hard time with uptake on that in the in the pregnant population. So I feel like we need data that says that if you want to protect your newborn, and that's really the message that we have to give, if you want to protect your newborn, you have to get vaccinated in every pregnancy. But we need a lot more data on what happens when you vaccinate a pregnant woman and how long does their immunity last. Thank you both for providing comment. I'm gonna to move to Dr. Paling and then we'll go to Dr. Cotton. Okay. so. Um, I am thrilled we're having this conversation about pregnant and lactating women because I think it is um, an essential conversation. And if I recall the data that we saw at the last meeting, um, we saw that COVID vaccine during pregnancy decreased your risk of preterm delivery, oh. decreased your risk uh, the, of being hospitalized and going to the ICU with respiratory problems so, so I sent and decrease the risk. To CC. Oh, just, so all just one second. Please go ahead. 
um, and decrease the risk of low birth weight, decrease the risk of um, uh, NICU hospitalization, um, and decrease the risk of hospitalization with COVID afterwards. So the, pro the benefits were profound, and seeing that over time is really important. Um, I'm going to switch now and then talk about the um, children. In one of the components that I'm hearing to answer your question is that the message needs to Sorry, we unintentionally got muted. Um, and so I wanted to talk about the children in the primary series. What I am hearing from families and community is that we need one message across the age groups. And so um, for me, I would like some data, and I do know we have colleagues that are doing all kinds of clinical trials, and I would like to know, um, I recognize you showed data showing the vast majority of older children have had um, COVID, and the seroprevalence is high. I would like to see a study saying, okay, you've just got one bivalent vaccine, what is the benefit and how long does that last? I think that would enhance the confidence in making a change rather than on inferring the data. And so for me, I would focus on all children. I do take care of immigrants and children that haven't been vaccinated um, across the age group. And that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cotton? Thank you very much for this excellent um, presentation and excellent discussion. Um, we've certainly had a lot of questions about this topic, um, especially where many people had a, a, a dose of bivalent vaccine as early as last September. I will say that for the immunocompromised, the situation is much better than it has been. It's been uh, a terrific journey with initially three doses um, of the primary series, followed by additional doses and now the bivalent um, vaccine. And we are seeing much lower rates of severe disease. In fact, um, when we do see um, immunocompromised patients who are infected, we usually initiate antiviral treatment um, uh, as soon as possible. And we are seeing um, very, very low rates uh, far less than 5% of severe disease in people who are immunocompromised, well vaccinated, and receive um, standard antiviral treatment. So things have really changed dramatically. And I would say that that's even in the setting of having lost the efficacy of the preventative monoclonal antibody Evusheld. So um, things have really changed, uh, which is good. There are still many, many immunocompromised who have not taken the opportunity to get the bivalent vaccine. And I do think that from what I hear from patients, it's mostly just fatigue. And they thought that they were, you know, three and done. And they sort of, it's a lot about the, the fatigue or not being fully um, aware of the opportunity. So um, the majority of immunocompromised patients I'm seeing are actually not up to date with their bivalent. So I would encourage anyone who hasn't had a bivalent to go ahead and get the bivalent um, vaccine. I do think that moving forward, um, I really like this idea about flexibility. Um, and if the FDA decides that there can be some enhanced flexibility around recommendations, I think that that will be helpful. It has been really terrific over the course of the pandemic when we saw um, the disease rates were higher in immunocompromised. We were able to give, you know, an additional dose of um, vaccine based on that. And so we will need to be responsive to upcoming um, increases in disease activity or uh, viral strains, uh, viral variants, et cetera. So um, I think flexibility will be um, key. Um, so thank you very much for thinking of that. I do think that there are even special populations such as uh, people of um, who are older and immunocompromised. And for me, that's perhaps one of the highest risk populations. So um, we, I look forward to working on those populations together and seeing if perhaps they need annual or perhaps they need 
twice a year um, vaccination. Um, I will say, um, with all due respect, Dr. Sanchez, I don't think that uh, twice a year vaccine would um, be too challenging for many immunocompromised patients who really uh, want to protect themselves. So from my perspective, that would be a reasonable approach, but I don't think we're there yet. And it's not clear that we need it based on the relatively low uh, disease rates and certainly low severe disease rates that we are seeing in people who are currently up to date and well vaccinated by current recommendations. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. McNally. Thank you. Dr. Oliver, can you comment on whether or not the work group has discussed if there's a role for shared clinical decision making, for example, in the older adult population or the people with immunocompromising conditions? And then my second question is, is there a concern that inequities would result if certain groups or populations were recommended to have more than one dose per year? Thank you. Um, thank you. So, um, yes, the, the work group has talked about um, populations that may benefit from a very strong recommendation um, and populations who may benefit from more of a permissive. Um, and I think that is a little bit where some of that flexibility comes in. It may be hard. There are some populations where it's hard to make a population level um, where it's the same for everyone, um, immunocompromised persons, where their you know um, timing of immunocompromising, uh, you know their immune uh, reconstitution could vary. So, so there's a variety um, that and populations where that kind of benefit risk margin may be more narrow. So, so yes, um, nobody was comfortable. Um, they felt like the the data weren't quite there to to propose like a structure um, for that yet. Um, acknowledging that there's still a lot of uncertainty with the epidemiology, with kind of the, the duration of um, what it looks like with the bivalent vaccines right now. And so um, I think uh, there was an understanding that I think that strength of recommendation and flexibility could be something we could use in the future. The counter to that is we know simple recommendations <laughs> are easy to communicate. And so we would not want, you know, there, there's a balance there. And so I think the, the work group tries their best to balance um, both. Um, and then as from an inequity standpoint, I will say that, that the, the work group really does try to, to think about that. We have some excellent kind of liaison members on the work group that, that try to make sure we're continuing to think through that. Um, we've reviewed kind of inequities that, that exist currently with our, um, with our bivalent vaccine recommendations as is, and, and so ways that we can, can improve those. I do think both the concept of simple recommendations that everyone can understand, as well as making sure that we remove barriers. Um, we have heard that sometimes people get blamed for being vaccine hesitant when they're not vaccine hesitant, they just have barriers to actually getting the vaccine. And it's not fair to, to kind of blame them for being vaccine hesitant. So I think we need to look at that writ large for all of our recommendations moving forward. Um, I'm looking. Dr. Evelyn Twentyman has helped us with a lot of our equity stuff, so I'm going to actually see if there's anything else she wants to, to say on that specifically, because I think it's an important point. Thanks, Dr. Oliver. I agree with what you said, and I really appreciate the question. I wanted to add only that whenever our complexity of recommendations increase to the point of compromising delivery in any way through clinician frustration, through public COVID-19 message fatigue, it is those people with less strong access to our healthcare system as it is who will be affected, whether they want to get the vaccine or not. And so I think equity is actually quite wrapped up in this discussion today. Thank you so much for raising that. Ms. Bata. Um, I think generally I'm in agreement with all of these um, three questions that uh, we, we need to make sure that our um, naive children are getting um, a primary series um, and that uh, we may need to be watching our older adults. Um, one of the things, the lingering question I have is related to the dosing um, for the bivalent and using that as a primary series, and um, I'm, I'm assuming, but I may be wrong, that 
Um, we are moving into that dosing and comfortable A because of the total amount of antigen the person gets through the vaccine, but also because of the seroprevalence that we're seeing um, among the population. Uh, and so that just may not be an issue, but it is something that um, I do have concerns about. And I think that, um, I think that what, you, what the work group has done and what our subject matter experts and team here at CDC has done has been remarkable in trying to address everything that's unknown. Um, you know, it's a, it's a moving um, goalpost for us. Um, and so I, I wanna commend everyone for this. And I think that um, that simplification is really important moving forward for the general public because everyone's going, well, what now are they gonna do? What now are they gonna do? And I think that this, the, as we get more data, we, we are beginning to understand where we're headed. And I think this will be reassuring for the general public. Thank you. Dr. Hogue. Dr. Hogue, can you hear us? Okay, we'll move to Dr. Kane. So, um, and, and just uh, um, a fabulous presentation. I really appreciated the, uh, the data. Um, my, I guess my concern is I'm thinking about the children now who may still need a primary series. We're seeing a huge influx of uh, undocumented in immigrants, um, populations who've never received a vaccination before. But in a prior uh, data presentation, it showed that of the children that get hospitalized, 50% of them have no underlying medical conditions that we are aware of but yet they're sick enough to be hospitalized. And so I wondered, is there any kind of context related to maybe uh, food insecurity? Is nutrition impacting that? Or uh, is it uh, the environment that they live in where there may be um, um, like post-traumatic stress that impacts immunity, uh, uh, things of that nature? Do we look at that in terms of who may be required to have that primary series, and if we get the bivalent uh, uh, primary series, do you really need a bivalent primary series and a booster that's bivalent? Uh, so can we cut down on the number of vaccines we're actually offering our children from so much antigen um, um, protection that we're providing them? Um. Thank you. So I, I will say I, I don't know um, that we have uh, that level of kind of socio social factors um, for children, although um, uh, that sounds like an excellent study. So if our academic partners um, are able to conduct that, we'd be more than happy to highlight those data at ACIP because um, I, I think those are some very good questions. Um, I'm actually going to use this opportunity. It's, it is tangentially related to your question, but I think it's, it's been a point. But so Dr. Jefferson Jones, um, who's pulling double duty, because I'll acknowledge he, he um, <laughs> led a lot of RSV work yesterday, but he does excellent serum um, prevalence data um, for COVID. So he is on the line. And I think has a little bit of um, additional information he can say better than I can around some of the questions around uh, COVID vaccine in children or in, in populations who've had prior infection. Uh, Dr. Jones. All right, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Uh, hi, this is uh, Dr. Jones. So there is relatively little data um, in children, of course, compared with adults. And uh, because many vaccine effectiveness platforms can have difficulty in identifying previous infection, uh, particularly um, asymptomatic infection, um, a lot of the data comes from laboratory studies uh, looking at those that had a known previous infection and they were subsequently vaccinated or had a breakthrough infection. And at least among those studies, many of those were early on uh, in the pandemic show after a vaccination, one dose of a vaccine 
uh, led to neutralizing and binding antibodies that were at least as high or if not higher than those who received uh, a primary series. So based on those laboratory studies, among those that have previously been infected, one dose of a vaccine appears to give at least as a robust a response as a primary series. And among vaccine effectiveness studies, uh, again, the majority of which are, are in adults, uh, they have shown that hybrid immunity um, it does give superior protection compared to just infection-induced Im immunity. And though in infection-induced immunity does appear to uh, give uh, robust protection, particularly against severe disease, there is limited waning over uh, a long amount of time. And uh, it appears that uh, there's less, I said, available about one dose versus two in the vaccine effectiveness world, but the vaccination appears to um, increase or restore that immunity. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Dr. Hogue and then Dr. Lair. Thank you. <clears throat> can you hear me, Dr. Lee? We can. Thank you. Thanks so much. I apologize for that glitch in my technology. Uh, it's Michael Hogue with the American Pharmacists Association. First of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to our CDC colleagues um, who are working tirelessly to get uh, data out as quickly as possible. And I'm frankly just amazed at, at the work that um, CDC's uh, uh, staff and uh, professionals and scientists perform, and I don't think you guys get enough credit for it. So I want to make sure that you uh, are recognized appropriately uh, during this forum. I want to uh, speak to a couple of points that are that are inherent in the questions Dr. Oliver has asked. One is um, uh, up to this point, of course, uh, as we've moved quickly through the pandemic and we get new information and vaccines have come to market, we've We've had a somewhat um, uh, a rigid approval process through FDA for the um, for the vaccines that are there, and I think Dr. Cotton used the word flexibility. And I would like to recommend that we uh, that FDA and CDC going forward, as it specifically relates to people with immunocompromising conditions and perhaps the uh, oldest of older adults, um, that there be flexibility. I think that the data only supports an annual booster at this point, but things change as we know with this virus. And so having language in the approval of whatever vaccine uh, ends up being our bivalent formulation in the future that allows clinicians to make decisions based upon the latest um, epidemiology and transmission of disease um, and specific patient factors. Um, I also think it's worth mentioning that there are individuals out there who are very much on top of their health. Uh, we've talked a lot about the people who are not getting immunized with the bivalent booster, but there are a lot of people out there who really are paying close attention and really want to make sure that they're as protected as possible uh, because of their underlying conditions. And Having that conversation uh, on the front lines with their pharmacist or with their physician, we want those clinicians to be able to make good decisions um, for the individual patient based upon their comfort and, and desire, uh, as long as we have safety uh, in mind. And it's clear that, um, at, that we do, in fact, have a very safe vaccine with our uh, bivalent vaccine. So I, I feel like that you know, flexibility just needs to be put into this uh, in some way with both older adults and people with immunocompromising conditions. Um, the last uh, couple, just two comments. One is I would like to make an appeal to our pharmaceutical manufacturers who are producing these products that as we move into what appears to be a new phase of potentially annual boosters with the bivalent products, that you please, please um, be uh, attentive to um, the presentation of your products, the labels, the colors of the vials, um, if single dose syringes or single dose vials across the board are possible, 
um, frontline healthcare providers working in physicians' offices and pharmacies would be grateful for uh, the, the least amount of confusion possible in those product presentations, and I hope that you will do so. Um, the last comment is about minoritized communities, and uh, equity is a major concern um, to me and to, I think, the pharmacy community. Um, we know up to this point that uh, Hispanic and Latino uh, individuals in particular are more likely to get immunized in a pharmacy than they are in other points of care based upon some recent data. Um, and we know that um, these recommendations uh, are, are critical to follow as we go forward. And so I'm, again, simplification very much in favor of that, but ensuring that we have access um, across all of our communities. Uh, I, Dr. Oliver, I will just bring up a question that I think uh, Dr. Sanchez asked earlier, but I didn't hear the answer to, and that is where does the Novavax product fit into all of this? I know there are a lot of a lot of pharmacists and physicians who have been asking questions about that product, and could you briefly just tell us what uh, where Novavax's product fits into all of this? Thanks. I will say we were just saying that we need to make sure before we at the end we we come back to that question. So happy to do it now. Um, I will say that for right now we we were very intentional, especially in the last presentation when we talked about the transition from monovalent to bivalent um, for the primary series. Those discussions were focused on the mRNA vaccine. So for right now, um, no. Uh, Changes are anticipated. Um, the, the primary series that is currently authorized and recommended for Novavax um, is, is monovalent, and it's our understanding that that will continue um, to, to be available and, and recommended um, uh, as is. I know there were discussions moving forward um, for... Uh, the future of bivalent vaccines kind of across all manufacturers, including the protein subunit um, for... Um, you know, for future doses. Um, and for that, I may turn, I think we have Novavax colleagues um, on the line. So I don't know if they have a, a comment they want to make about planning for future as it relates to the Novavax vaccines. Hi, this is Danny Kim. I'm the chief safety officer for Novavax. I think, uh, I, I don't think I have other colleagues on the line. So I'll chime in. Maybe I'll just give a second or two to see if there's some of my other colleagues. The um, so not hearing anyone else. Uh, I, I will say I, I think I think you have that right. Is that we're in discussions with the FDA, and I, I think the the next uh, two to three months will will get a lot more clarity on sort of um, the future directions going forward, both for the fall and winter campaign for 2023 and future vaccination regimens. But um, I can't offer much more clarity than that, other than that we are in active discussions with the FDA. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lair. Um, so to answer your specific questions about my thoughts on these questions on the board. I would like to echo Dr. Hogue and Dr. Cotton's um, encouragement for flexibility. I actually have patients who got the bivalent booster in early September and have asked me to write an off-label permission to get another bivalent now because they're traveling for the next couple of months. Um, there are people who are actively wanting regular updates on this. So if I were to make a suggestion on this one specifically, I would make a recommendation that everyone get a annual booster, and that would be a, a regular recommendation, and then a shared decision-making recommendation that certain categories of people, such as immunocompromised and people over 65, could decide along with their provider that they might want to get one every six months. I'm making up those dates, but that's just a thought. With regard to the children who may need a primary series, I would probably reframe that question because for me it's not really children, it's a question of whether you've had a primary series or the disease. And so if I've got an 11-month-old who's had COVID and Dr. Jones said that there's good evidence that if you've had the disease, 
that a booster would then be sufficient. It's not that it's an 11-month-old, it's someone that's got evidence of having the disease. So I would frame it that anyone who hasn't had the disease and hasn't had a primary series should be considered for a primary series, but if you have evidence for a disease, then you wouldn't need that. So those are my suggestions. Um, Dr. Daly. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lair, I just wanted to comment that, that, that um, th those suggestions we'll take back to the work group, but I think they're tremendously helpful in this, in this conversation. I, I, I will also say <clears throat> that, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I believe that our colleagues at the FDA who we've worked really closely with will, will also um, <clears throat> appreciate the importance of flexibility and I think that's a goal that they're that they're working towards not not to speak for them but my impression is that that's definitely a goal that they're working towards as well so <clears throat> so sometimes in these meetings there are comments made by uh, my colleagues that really resonate and that I think about hours and hours later and one of the comments made yesterday, both by Dr. Cotton and by Dr. Talbot, has really resonated with me, and I've been thinking about it ever since, which is we need to study these vaccines in the populations that we really need the best evidence for because those populations are particularly vulnerable, of special interest, and we need to really push for that. I was so struck by those comments. And, and I have not ever worked in industry, so I appreciate that these things need to happen in a stepwise manner and that for many things it is safest and most appropriate to first study in a healthy population. But once the safety and effectiveness has been established in a healthy population, I think we can quickly move towards <clears throat> studying in particularly vulnerable populations and that that should be part of the process. It should be baked into the cake. And so I think I would throw, I would make a couple suggestions. And, I, and again, I don't know entirely if these are the best suggestions or the only suggestions, but I would, I would argue that it would be ethical to have a randomized controlled trial of co-administration, COVID vaccine and influenza vaccine with the other arm being separate administration and we would learn a lot about immunogenicity and safety um, and that that might be valuable for this conversation, right? So again, an, a, a randomized control trial. So I think we need to distinguish between what we're gonna learn from observational studies and what we're gonna learn from RCTs and, and when is it appropriate to do RCTs in the context of that comment about let's study the vaccines in the people who need them the most as we, as we have this program. And another would be, frankly, it, it, there may be an opportunity to study uh, in particularly vulnerable populations. Everybody gets a booster in the fall and then are randomized to get a, an additional do dose six months later or not. And, and, and again, maybe that is not feasible or not ethical, but I think we need to have that conversation. So again, strong emphasis on um, for the sponsors and for our colleagues at the FDA, moving quickly to additional data in vulnerable populations that can help us make these decisions over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cotton. I wanted to just respond to that. Um, thank you very much for your eloquent remarks. I do think that in many of our deliberations over the past few days, it would be really helpful to have uh, additional data on the most vulnerable populations, um, either immunocompromised patients or comorbidities, or and it might be adult and it might be pediatric, but um, a lot of the data that we're looking at is just general population and actually excludes, sometimes excludes from the studies, the most vulnerable or people in most need of vaccine. So um, I would like to second everything you said about thinking about RCTs and including them um, with, a, with a focus on the people who may actually benefit the most from vaccine. So thanks very much for your remarks. Thank you, Dr. Grubb. 
Hi, thank you very much. And I really appreciate all, all that the presentation so far. Um, I just want to, um, two points, I wanted to reinforce what you just said about the, the importance of research. Um, and then the second point, because everyone else has already articulated it so well, I think it's so important about the messaging about it. I completely agree with simplification, but there's also a very large group of people who follow this very closely and they are aware of different levels of risk. And I think it's very important for this, um, this group to clearly articulate what the risk is for different people um, in terms of making decisions, both for the immunocompromised um, conditions and also really for in the future for people in the 18 to 50 year uh, 50 year old range as they're making their decisions in the future. Um, and also, I just wanted to reiterate, I think it's really interesting about the monitoring um, for immunity and how it may or may not wane over time and how that's going to uh, influence our future decision making for when we're making recommendations for boosters in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Sorry, I, and I uh, just want to acknowledge that you're from Novavax. You look like you raised your hand again. Yes, I, I, uh, th this is Denny Kim uh, from Novavax. And uh, I thought I'd offer some, uh, some more context. I, I think perhaps my previous answer was, uh, may not have been very satis or satisfying. Uh, and that we are in discussions with the FDA. I, I did want to say just in the context of the discussions in the ACIP that uh, our vaccine regimen in the, in the framework of a simplified regimen that our vaccine uh, for uh, 12 and over primary series is the same dose and presentation. And so uh, we, we feel that it's already simplified and it's also approved for a booster dose as well after the primary series. Uh, and uh, we are working on a bivalent formulation as well, and we'll be prepared to deliver that uh, based on what the FDA advises for the uh, fall and winter campaign. Um, and we are also working on, uh, we have a clinical study, an uh, aged de-escalation clinical trial that does utilize the same dose uh, as the primary series for 12 and over. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the additional clarifications. Um, Dr. Schaffner. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Uh, I, I would like to, first of all, thank everyone who's put this extraordinary session together today. It's been most, most useful. But uh, I'm speaking today to reinforce something that Dr. Hoke said, my, my colleague. It's a very practical point. It's been mentioned several times in previous meetings of this group namely the importance of single dose formulations that could potentially expand the number of locations across the country where vaccine would become available. I think more physicians offices and clinics and perhaps even pharmacies would be ready to provide vaccine. You know there's a certain reluctance uh, to go into a multi-dose vial if you only have one patient in front of you who needs the vaccine. I think we could enlist many more, at least physicians, to be active immunizers in the medical home uh, if we had single dose formulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schaffner. Um, I just, are there any other members that would like to weigh in or express a different opinion? <laughs> Um, I did want to just add a couple of comments, and I've been thinking about some of the comments throughout the session. Uh, so on the one hand, I actually prefer simplified messaging for the broader population because I think our messaging has gotten so complex that it's a barrier for people to think, understand how to best protect themselves. Um, on the other hand, I do think the flexibility for individual clinicians to be able to work with their patients makes a lot of sense. Um, because uh, there are always going to be situations or circumstances, and as long as um, you know we can do that safely, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, the challenge to us is that if we oversimplify the message, it's actually not helpful. And at the same time, if we allow for flexible use, it means we need really, really strong continued updating of cl clinical considerations um, to ensure that that benefit-risk balance is retained over time. Uh, so I don't have a right answer for you, but <laughs> I, I have been thinking like just a couple simple points. So one, um, you know, it is clear from the data that hybrid immunity is both the strongest and the longest, um, but all immunity wanes over time. So um, I, I am struggling because I feel like we, 
we, I, and this is my personal opinion, I'm struggling with the need to feel like I need to acknowledge um, that immunity is a combination of both infection and vaccination, um, which does not make our messaging simple in any way. Um, but that said, I think that's the thinking where I am now and how then to define where our gaps in immunity are. So then going back to your three questions, I think about you know who are the least likely to be immune, it's gonna be the youngest children. So you know, six months to two years as just a starting point right now. But I do think a simple recommendation of that age group would just be much more straightforward. And so, you know, all of those children should get a primary series and a very small minority of them have to date. And I think they're less protected and that's why we're seeing higher hospitalization rates in that population. And then to your second and third questions, the oldest and the immunocompromised, are um, more likely to get very sick from infection, even with full vaccination and even with prior uh, immunity or prior um, infection. So I do worry that um, that is a gap in immunity that we need to address. And again, being straightforward about our recommendations for those two populations and being simple about it, I think would be extremely helpful. But then I don't have an answer for all of the rest because it is a little bit confusing. Um, and so, if, you know, that, that to me is the challenge that we have ahead of us. So those three questions I think are straightforward. It's the rest of it that I, I struggle with. Um, the last thing, you know, I wanted to just go back to the points that were made earlier about, um, again, giving us the confidence that we need to speak confidently about vaccines so that the public can have the confidence they need. Um, and so when we are debating these points, you know, we are debating them scientifically, but it makes it really hard to have a simple and a straightforward message when we have all of these caveats trying to ensure that we are explaining the uncertainty. Um, so I, I do want to go back to our, our um, you know, industry colleagues as well as the FDA to help us in thinking about there is the specific scientific question in front of us, and then there is the... Um, how do we think about ensuring that we are maintaining uh, public confidence in vaccines? I realize those two are not always the same, um, but it would be really helpful to start to incorporate that thinking going forward. And then specific to the comment about um, you know, the challenges of special populations, again, where the data are the most uncertain, it could be pregnant women, it could be immunocompromised, and honestly, for COVID-19 vaccines, throughout, it has been our youngest kids. We have had the most data for the adult population, and we have had the least amount of data for the youngest kids. So I, I do feel like, um, you know, having that transparency about uh, what the plans are in place, and again, thinking about that confidence issue as sort of one of the end goals. And then the second being that... Um, it actually is, I mean, I feel like we have to ask these questions in the meeting about, well, are you going to do this um, and it's not going to happen? Like for me, it would just be easier to have transparency about it's we're, we've decided not to do this and this is the reason why. It's a little bit harder because I keep worrying that we want these studies to happen and I don't know if they're gonna happen and all that uncertainty makes this decision making even more complicated. So if there's a really good reason it can't be done, that would be really helpful to understand upfront so that we understand then how to go about what other types of information do we need to make that decision. Um, but it's just hard when we hear that there's just, it hasn't been discussed. Because uh, then we don't know where it's headed and we have to wait another few months to figure out what's going to happen. So those are my thoughts for the moment. Um, Dr. Lair. Um, thank you for those thoughts. I'd like to respectfully disagree. Um, if an 11-month-old has had it, had, it seems that they probably don't need a primary series. I think a fairly simple message would be if you've had documentation of a COVID illness, you don't need a primary series no matter what the age. And if you don't have documentation, you would need a primary series. And I think that's a fairly simple message in and of itself. So I would emphasize that reframing would be my suggestion. Dr. Sanchez. I just want to say I, I agree with Jamie. Yeah. Dr. Paling. I would like to add that children, younger children do not have as robust of immune response. And I would like to have some data 
before I made that decision. Um, and I think we can obtain exactly that data, and uh, that way we could follow the science. <clears throat> the second thing I'm thinking about is as we're trying to communicate clearly, what, is, what are we trying to prevent? We are trying to prevent de uh, deaths and severe disease. And one of the misperceptions is that children are rel um, get mild disease. And um, it is true that death among children is fortunately infrequent. However, I think one of the perspectives we should be looking at is, is COVID-19 in the top 10 cause of, disease, of deaths among the age groups? And the answer so far for all age groups is yes, which does further emphasize the importance of vaccination. And I'd encourage us to look at it from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back to a topic that we discussed briefly yesterday. And it's, the days kind of blur together just a little bit. but. <laughs> At some point in the last several days, I think we've discussed this several times, which is that, um, you know, we have a opportunity for tremendous disease prevention through COVID vaccination if people get vaccinated. And I think if adults are uninsured or underinsured, then as we transition to a commercialized product, then those are individuals who will not have the opportunity by and large to be vaccinated and so I would love to have at least <clears throat> some understanding of what is the possibility, feasibility, likelihood of some um, vaccines for adults program that could pay for vaccines for uninsured and underinsured adults. Um, you know, kind of what, what is the feasibility and possibility of that, of that happening? Thank you. Hi, this is Sarah Meyer. Um, <laughs> thanks for that question. As was, I think, mentioned uh, in earlier parts of this meeting, that was included as a proposal in the president's budget. But in order for that to be enacted, it would have to be um, basically authorized and uh, funded by Congress. And I don't know if Dr. Romero wants to add anything there. So, Dr. Daly, it is one of the things that keeps me up at night. Um, I'll speak bluntly. We could run into an inequity cliff, right? Um, and have populations that are clearly unable to access vaccine. Populations that we know from previous years are at high risk for acquisition of disease, um, and we need to protect. So I, I can tell you that um, I'm, uh, for my part, I, I, I'm actively working to convince uh, legislature and people in general of the need for this. Um, this will be an incremental program. This won't be something that will be started and be fully funded. I think that it will grow over time. Um, we have a while to go yet, but CDC is committed to this. Uh, we think it's very important. I think it's very important. Um, and we'll continue to champion this issue forward. Thank you, Dr. Romero and Dr. Meyer. Are there any other questions, comments? Dr. Talbot. Um, some of this is a thank you and some of this is a, we're here to support you. Um, this has been one of the best meetings for me since we've coined the word VFA. Um, and we've been talking about vaccines for adults. Um, It's one of the most fulfilling reasons that I do ACIP is knowing that we can actually give adults a healthier life. Um, and so thank you for discussing it this time. Thank you for the enthusiasm and thank you for working on this. I know it is not easy um, to change, um, change the course of a ship, but um, thank you, it is appreciated and um, I won't start chanting VFA. <laughs> thank you. I think with that, we are um, going to try and adjourn the meeting. So I want to thank all of our speakers. 
our CDC colleagues, um, our ACIP members, ex officio members, and liaison members. Oh, oh, I see. There's, well, okay. Dr. Freihofer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee. Sandra Freihofer. Uh, representing the American Medical Association, but speaking as a practicing physician, I also wanted to amplify uh, Dr. Schaffner's uh, plea to have single dose vials or preferably pre filled syringes available and to be allows practices to, to uh, purchase vaccine in small quantities. Um, also, a reminder, and I know ACIP has their hands tied, our um, in my office, our current supply of bivalent vaccine is about to expire. So if there is going to be a recommendation for an additional vaccine, I would really hope that we would hear about that before um, those vaccine doses expire. And just also to express appreciation uh, to this whole process um, through vaccination and through mitigation um, efforts, I, have, uh, I haven't lost a patient to COVID yet. Uh, and I have a practice filled of older patients with immunocompromising conditions and multiple medical conditions. And I, I, I really, um, in my heart, know that, that our work on COVID vaccines and making these vaccines available have saved so many lives and may had such a, a major uh, positive effect on my practice. And also there are patients that you know, a lot of we all have vac we all have vaccine fatigue, but there are, are patients, as was mentioned uh, early in this discussion, that would like to get an additional dose just to keep that protection. And finally, the role of antibodies. Patients keep asking about antibody levels. They want to get their antibody levels tested. Maybe I, I wish we had more information about using antibody levels to perhaps recommend uh, who needs a booster when. And again, thank you for a great meeting. And that's all. <laughs> thank you. Um, Dr. Wharton, do we have any further business? Uh, we do not, Dr. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I want to thank all, everyone again for um, all of your time and your efforts. Uh, it has been an incredible three-day meeting. Um, we are very grateful for your willingness to um, to be here, be present, and to deliberate um, so transparently um, and in such a, a, a timely way to the, with the public in mind. Um, so any objections to adjourning to today's meet three-day meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, I see no objections. So, and I hear no objections. So today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everyone. <laughs>